So, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hard to be a short person. Um, my presentation today will be on the ideology of museum categories, not just the ethnographic museum, but I will look at different types of museums, art museum, and the so-called universal museum as a discursive chain. And I will start uh, somewhere in the late 19th century when uh, multidisciplinary cabinets of curiosity transformed into museums. And that became more and more specialized and separated by um, discipline, as Tony Bennett has called the exhibitionary complex emerged. Meanwhile, there were processes of inclusion and exclusion that unfolded. So in this process, Western and non-Western objects were separated and museums for Western and non-Western culture or European and non-European culture started to function as communicating vessels. In a Saidian sense of the word, it's each type of museum was showing the self-image of Europe in a colonial context. So what went out of the class case in one museum went in in another. So I will examine this and uh, what it means for museums today. And my focus will be on the Middle East and Islamic objects because, well, that's my background. And also because as in between cultures, they are very illuminating on how identity was defined. And the word Middle East, of course, already indicates this in-betweenness. It's in between Asia and Europe. It's in between civilizations. And I will look mainly at the Netherlands. So my first example is the Royal Cabinet of Curiosities that was housed in what is now the Maurits House in The Hague. And it was founded by the Dutch King Willem I in 1816. Its collections were an eclectic mix, as many of these uh, cabinets of curiosities consisting of objects relating to important events in Dutch history, but also objects relating from trade relations, the Dutch India Company, um, weapons from Sri Lanka, for instance, mogul jewelry from India, and complemented by luxury objects. It's beautiful objects from gold, silver, and ivory. And when in 1883 the museum was dissolved, most of the collection was divided over two museums. The ethnographic objects were given to the Museum of Ethnology, where we are now, and the European objects, as well as objects that were relating to comparative applied arts, were donated to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And this sparked a debate among curators um, at the time. Didn't many non-European objects belong to comparative applied arts? And they decided to determine for each group of objects whether its aesthetic value or functional use was more important. The resulting division uh, may now look arbitrary to us, but it uh, nicely followed 19th century lines of thought, which we can still find today. So I look at two objects um, with uh, two Islamic objects. Um, the first is the one on the right, um, which is a, a Sultan's Chris from uh, South Sulawesi. And almost all objects from Indonesia were transferred to the Museum of Ethnology, although they were credited with having ethnographic value as well as artistic merit. When they were discussing, they said, oh, Africa, that's clear, that's ethnography. There's no aesthetics there. But in Indonesia, there was quite a debate because they thought, and this kind of weapon was mentioned uh, quite often as, um, yeah, was, was uh, visually pleasing, it was well made. Um, but um, the curator of ethnology here successfully argued that its knowledge about use was much more advanced than the knowledge about craftsmanship uh, of Indonesian objects. So the dagger was added to the ethnographic collection. And to the left, we see um, a Hedwig Beeger from Norman Sicily. This was made in Europe for a Christian ruler, but what they didn't know then, that it was, well, probably made in, in, um, in Egypt, uh, Islamic Egypt, Iran, or Syria. My second example um, are two Mughal objects from Mughal India. Aesthetic value was measured by beauty and shape, color, and material, or craftsmanship. This was the criterion that you can find in the, in the correspondence. Uh, the division reveals what was considered good art or bad art, um, according to 19th century European norms, of course. Um, we can see this already in the, in the case of the Chris dagger, but also in these two objects. They were made in the same period, but the, the, 
the bowl on the left and also the other glass work ended up in the Rijksmuseum, but all the miniature paintings were sent to the Museum of Ethnology, where they could be studied as illustrations of life in India. And what is ironic is that these paintings were uh, made for, for Dutch, um, for Dutch uh, people uh, Dutch clientele and in Europeanized style, but the Museum of Ethnology vowed that anything that had European influence was not pure and shouldn't enter its collections. But of course, many of these objects do have such a mix. And then um, we move on a little bit further in time. In uh, 1903, the Leiden Museum of Antiquities and the Museum of Ethnology decided to mark their territories. And the decades before, they had been debating um, and, and based their demarcation on dead versus living cultures. But now there was a shift in focus. It was decided that the Museum of Antiquity would focus on European culture, and hence, and I quote now from the report in the archives, the antiquities of the people of North Africa, West Asia, and Europe, whose civilizations are considered forerunners of our civilization, should be placed in the Museum of Antiquities, but all the remaining antiquities in the Museum of Ethnology. So following this statement, 5,000 objects from Southeast Asia, the Americas, and Sub-Saharan Africa were transferred to the Museum of Ethnology, while the collections from Pharaonic Egypt and the ancient Middle East could, could stay. Among the objects that were sent away were also some from Iraq, Yemen, and Turkey from the Islamic period, um, and Iran, uh, like this gravestone, because as a living tradition, Islam was no forerunner to our civilization. This distinction between the Islamic and the pre-Islamic periods of the Middle East also reinforced the idea of Islam as a non-European entity. Like other European museums of the time, in the chain of art, Islamic art was situated as a link between classical antiquity and Renaissance Europe. So Islamic art was related to Europe but did not belong to it. In other countries, you see a similar ambivalence. Um, this is a drawing, it's quite famous, um, of the, the art collections at the British Museum, and it shows a hierarchy of art. Um, it's not chronologically arranged, but according to stage of development. So the bottom half, this is Hindu, Japanese, and Mexican art. Then there's ancient Near East and Egypt in the middle. Then there's Etruscan and early Greek remains, and at the top we find the Parthenon sculptures. Islamic art, uh, this is from uh, 1845. Uh, 45, so Islamic art was not yet admitted to the canon of arts. This only happened around the turn of, this, of the century. So at the late 19th century British Museum, the exhibitions ex included a section on medieval, medieval Europe and an ethnography section, which was uh, along geographical lines, so Amer Africa, Americas, Oceania, and so on and so forth. Muslim objects fe featured in both sections. Most of what we now call Islamic art was placed in the ethnographic section, as it did not fit with European decorative arts. However, oddly enough, 19th century uh, Iranian metalwork was included in the medieval gallery, because it, sh it represented continuity with uh, Europe. So why is this uh, history important for us today? Well, obviously. <laughs> because it's still, uh, these colonial paradigms still live on in our current structure of the museum landscape. Um, we see it very nicely in museums of Islamic art. In Paris, Middle Eastern art and culture is divided over two museums. Uh, the Louvre, which shows Islamic art from the 8th to the 17th century in a separate wing. And according to the website, which you see here, it reveals the radiant face of a civilization that encompassed an infinitely varied <laughs> wealth of humanity. I couldn't uh, <laughs> stop <laughs> quoting this. Um, with the antiquities of the ancient Near East and Egypt, again, they're presented as precursors to European culture. Islamic art is the only non-Western art admitted to this temple of uh, Western civilization. But then on the other bank of the river. Uh, the Musée, Musée du Quai Branly shows the material culture of the same countries from the 19th and the 20th century, taken from the collections of two uh, former ethnographic museums. Uh, with its focus on the so-called primitive arts, its North Africa and Middle Eastern section represents a rural population rather than urban life. 
There are no signs of civilization by French enlightenment, enlightenment norms. No objects with Arabic calligraphy, no scientific instruments, no figurative paintings. All of these can be found in the Louvre. So together, these two museums convey a colonial trope of a once highly civilized population that went into decline and needed to be saved by Western rule. Moreover, the division of objects over this museum reveals the processes of inclusion and exclusion. Who belongs to us, who belongs to them, even though the objects are in between, as Philip also said, and I just showed. Um, and of course, in the Netherlands, we have a similar division with on one hand the Rijksmuseum, which has a very small display of Islamic art, and here the museums of ethnology. In most European cities, Islamic art is part of museums showing art in the Europe European sense of the word. In Paris, the Louvre, in Berlin, where the Mu Islamic Art Museum is located on Museum Island and shares a building with the Pergamon Museum. The vision behind this is the ancient Middle East as a cradle of civilization and Islam as a bridge linking the achievements of antiquity with Europe. As Edward Said remarked, the Middle East is Europe's closest other and one of its fiercest cultural contestants. Yet when the region was no longer perceived as a rival, its culture was placed in ethnographic museums, together with those regions that supposedly had no history, like Africa, Oceania, and much of Asia. It seems that the closer to the present in time, the more distance needed to be created between the Middle East and Europe. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, decolonization. And I start with uh, Islamic art. Um, and a little bit the history of Islamic art for those who are not familiar with that. Uh, the notion of Islamic art developed in Europe in, in the late 19th century in the context of both archaeology and Orientalism. In the beginning, it was bound up with prejudices about race and religion. And in the 20th century, when decolonizing the, the discipline, art, uh, historians of Islamic art left behind racial notions that was very strong in the beginning, such as that Persians, being Aryans, have artistic capacities in contrast to Semites and Turks. Um, also, really, this is, you read it so often. <laughs> I'm not offended. <laughs> um, also, the temporal boundaries were enlarged from the 15th century to the 18th, 18th century, and its uh, geographical reach was expanded. However, the conception of art, which informs the discipline, remained rather Eurocentric. Art is still defined as material culture produced for the ruling classes and their entourage, making a clear distinction between high culture and low culture. Furthermore, the more performative nature the arts take on in many parts of the Muslim world is not taken into account because it prioritizes the figurative arts. Um, so I would call this a departure approach, and I would like to compare this to the departure approaches I see to uh, this, the decolonization in museums. Um, and I want to make a few observations. Um, in museums, we too often approach decolonization through the lens of the individual object, groups of objects, the museum, or a category of museums, like the ethnographic museum. This is perhaps because of our focus on the deconstruction of museum histories and narrative, which is, of course, necessary. We need to do that. But as many have argued, it again puts the West central and therefore does very little for the rethinking of the material culture concerned. But it might also take a broader angle in asking us to look at the museum landscape from a more holistic perspective. Um, yeah, if we really want to dissolve these 19th century paradigms in museums, we need to somehow break down the walls between these various in institutions and rethink their collections. Um, and it, in order to create such a, a third space, uh, deconstruction and critique needs to follow up by another step, reconstruction. Um, and then I want to quote um, Clementine de Lis, the controversial uh, and former director of the Weltkultur Museum in Frankfurt. And she speaks of ethnographic collections as sources for rewriting histories. Um, because she says, well, these collections are not often realized for what they are, testimonies uh, and material realities of world histories and world art histories. Um, 
It includes a material uh, legacy that has not been included in, in the narratives of Western historical museums of great art collections. And these artifacts from around the world could become the point of a partner for a new interdisciplinary development, one that would engage not only history and anthropology, but also post-colonial studies and questions of materiality." Unquote. Um, during her time as the director of the Welt Kultur Museum in Frankfurt, she regularly invited artists to work with the collections. Um, and she speaks of the, the ethnographic museum as a monument to colonial violence. Um, but as museum functions as communicating vessels, the art museum, the archaeology museum, the universal museum too is a monument to colonial violence for the way in which it removed the non-Western out of its spaces or appropriated it to serve its own ideological agenda. Um, what is often overlooked, and I see this also in this conference, is a lot of emphasis on a certain parts of ethnographic collections, um, but a certain part is, uh, is almost never uh, taken into account, and that's the, the part of the collection that is uh, collected after colonialism. I'm not saying they're not colonial, Wayne. <laughs> I'm just saying uh, that in the museums I work for, more than 60% of the collection was assembled after independence. And these ob objects often speak of modernity, of, um, um, of the material culture of Africa, Asia, of the 1960s and 70s up till today. And like the colonial collections, they embody political, economic, and social histories. But the emphasis is, is and it, for me, it's, again, it confirms a colonial gaze. The emphasis is on the so-called primitive, on the, the animist. And rarely I find um, that artists or critics or academics engaging with these collections in, in, in new narratives, taking into account these other objects that are also now collections. Anyway, two years ago, we, we staged an exhibition about the 1960s as a period of global exchange. And it was an opportunity to investigate the meaning of our collections as objects of history and to in reinterpret them as carriers of transnational collection, connections and to reinstate them as part of a global history. So some of the objects, um, yeah, like to the left you see, uh, this is a skirt and blouse that was uh, bought by, in 1962 by the Tropa Museum from a tailor in Accra, Ghana. Uh, and it was once featuring in the museum as the attire of a traditional West African woman, but in the 60s exhibition, um, it told the, 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 the story of a transcultural story of the blending of European and African fashion styles, the African creative use of Dutch flex fabric, and its adaptation by the American civil rights movement. So, um, this exhibition was just a moderate a time from our side to explore the post-colonial, and certainly not enough, but um, because if the museum re really wants to change, we need more than a shift in curatorial practice, we need a change at the core of the system. And I doubt if the Islamic Art Museum can decolonize while staying within the European framework of art. I also doubt if the ethnographic museum can decolonize and continue the dichotomous model, the West and the rest on which it was built. Um, so the question I'm asking today is, if we look at the division over disciplines and the separation from the West as a type of colonial violence, uh, one that lives on in the present, what are the possibilities we have for repair? So I want to leave it at that. Thank you.